Yeah, I'm going to talk about how we use Nextflow at the Sanger. I will have some introduction about our infrastructure, why we use Nextflow, why it's useful for us, and what else we do as well. So, yeah, as Phil mentioned, our program is called Cellular Genetics uh, Program. It's one of the four programs of the Sanger Institute. So it's, it's a bunch of very talented and good group leaders. So we mostly concentrate on, uh, oh, sorry, on cell, cell atlasing. So it's human cell atlas is one of the projects we work on. Um, we are starting working on large scale imaging analysis for special transcriptomics pretty soon. Uh, also we do a bit of genomics uh, and also computational method development for mostly for single cell RNA-seq data. Um, so what my team is doing is, so the team was created this year, beginning of this year, when basically the, the program realized they need some, some standardized way of analyzing all the data that we have. So what we do, we provide computational support for the program, which is about 180 people at the moment. And uh, so we work both on upstream and downstream analysis pipelines. Uh, we interact with all the faculty members, trying to figure out what their needs are, what are the requirements, and so on. And recently, additional challenge that we have is the Sangha. Uh, it was a welcome trust decision that we should move from a classical LSF uh, farm to, to cloud environment. Uh, so I will have a few slides about why it, it was decided that we move to the cloud to give you an idea of Maybe, I think that this problem now, uh, many institutes, research institutes have this kind of decision to make now, whether to stay on the classical farm or to move to the cloud. So for Sanger, it was kind of easier because Sanger, you know, it's a huge sequencing center. There, there is lots of data. And uh, because, because of the data size, I think the decision was pretty clear. So what's happening nowadays is that the data is growing, and usually instead of uh, copying your data somewhere to analyze it, what, what, what is happening now, you, you, you move your pipelines to the data instead, and you run them on premise instead of moving the data. So as you can see, the, the sequencing data growth is kind of, this is exponential scale here, and uh, uh, basically the amount of data is growing enormously. So this, this creates lots of challenges, security, data security, costs, and governance as well. Um, additionally, there are lots of collaborative initiatives where uh, big institutes decide to have, you know, one project which they will work on and the data is generated in one institute and the pipelines coming from another institute. So for this to work, you need some kind of infrastructure. And Human Cell Atlas is actually one of those uh, big projects. And finally, reproducibility, which used to be a very hot topic. Now it's probably not as hot as before, but it still stays that, uh, you know, if you, have, if you have your own infrastructure uh, and it's not cloud, you have all the software installed, it, it's not easy to run the same pipelines that you run on your site in a different place. You'll have all kinds of problems with dependencies and uh, Others. So it, this is solved now by using containers such as Docker or Singularity, and this is what widely used on the cloud nowadays. So I've covered I've covered three uh, major challenges in uh, kind of in current state of uh, compute, but there are some more. There are costs. There are delivery, reliability, scalability, and basically all of these things can be covered by by a uh, using a cloud environment. And that's why it was decided by Welcome Trust that Sangha should move to the cloud. So what we have at the moment is an OpenStack cloud. We have it, it's a private cloud. We have it on, on site. Uh, but I mean, it's principally it's the, the same cloud as anything else, it's like Amazon. Um, and, you know, it's also there were, there were estimations and um, so our IT people estimated that it's cheaper to have your own private cloud if you run something constantly, like what we do, uh, as, as opposed to when you have kind of peak 
activity. So when you need to calculate something huge very quickly, then it's, it's cheaper to use commercial clouds. And that's why we went for the private cloud, because at the Sun we have a sequencing facility, and all the data goes from sequencing facility to the cloud, and it's kind of constant load of data. Uh, so what did we have so far? So, so far at the Sangha, we had an uh, LSF system, which, which is provided by IBM. So uh, what happens is that after the sequencing machine data goes to, to the IROTS database, which, uh, which is one of the cheapest options for storing large amounts of data, and that's why we stay with it. It's quite, it's, it's quite flexible and it works, so that's why we use it. And then when, when we want to analyze the data, we usually copy the data from iRODS to another storage system, which is called Secure Luster. And this storage system is very fast in terms of I.O., so you can, you can run your pipelines very quickly. It's, it's a very fast storage system. And what usually happens is that then you run your jobs using LSF. It's the same as Slurm or SGE, so you just start jobs in parallel. And the software is usually installed there, so you have, it's, it's a Unix system, so you have your local folder where you can install the software. And some software is provided uh, generally by IT people. And then once, once you're finished, you kind of copy your results to some uh, back, uh, so Luster is not backed up. And then we have another storage system which is backed up, so you can copy everything there, so you have your results backed up. And then you would copy them to your local computer and do some more analysis on your computer. So here there are some uh, challenges. So for example, uh, on, LSF, on our LSF farm, Docker and Singularity are not supported. Uh, you have problem with dependencies. So you, you would, uh, to install some softwares, sometimes it's a big problem because they conflict with other software. Uh, and what people usually use is bash script. So you, you, you write a bash script which creates thousands of jobs for you, and then you run it. Yeah. I understand why there is no Docker, but there is a specific reason why you cannot use Singularity? Um, so I think the hardware that we have on this farm is uh, quite old, and it doesn't support Singularity. We have a new LSF, small LSF farm on the cloud where Singularity is supported. No. Yeah. So when I started, basically I had a big dilemma what to choose to run the pipelines um, and uh, at that time I contacted Phil because I knew I knew him from the Baberham Institute and basically he pointed me out to Nextflow um, and then I had a couple of uh, calls with Paolo and after that basically I decided to go for it and uh, so that's how when I started I was on my own there was a group but it was just me so I had to run things very quickly, and I think that was the main motivation to use Nextflow because CWL was it was very hard to start with. So there are some groups at the Sangha who are running it, but it's uh, the framework that they use is quite complex, and it's it, it would take a lot of time to set up. Um, and also Nextflow looked much more advanced than anything else on the market at that time, so it was an easy decision. Obviously, people always complain, you know. It's not a community effort. There are some, you know, Paolo is, is alone, but you know, you have to make this decision at some point. And you know, I made it and I, I, I'm very happy. Um, so yes, Stain here is the, now he completely took over all the Nextflow stuff from me. So I don't, I don't do much Nextflow nowadays. Uh, so if you have any questions about what I present, you can ask Stain afterwards. Uh, so this slide, you, <laughs> yes. So this slide you, you've seen before, so also Nextflow basically satisfied all these requirements that we needed uh, for the cloud. Um, so you, you, you should be familiar with this slide. And then uh, basically the first contact I made about the pipelines was Phil again. So I took, I took his RNA seq pipeline, which was one of the most uh, demanding pipelines at that time. And it was not an F core at that time, so it was just RNA seq pipeline, NGI, and then it became an F core afterwards. So we have our GitHub repository where you can find all our pipelines. Uh, so yeah, now there will be a few slides on how we initially run 
next flow on LSF, uh, and what kind of challenges we had, and so on. Um, so as I said, it was it worked from scratch. So when I installed it, it was very easy to run, and that's why I basically started using it. Didn't need any tweaking at all, I would say. And uh, for the software, initially we went with Bioconda. Uh, that's what Phil presented yesterday in an F-Core initiative. And some software was locally installed. Um, and what we usually do, we basically load, we source the Conda environment first, and then we run uh, Nextflow. So then this um, integration with Conda was developed this summer but we are still probably doing the same thing. So it doesn't really matter, I think, what, which order you do. And uh, also additionally, because we had IROT system, we can't, we can't use NF core pipelines from the box. So we, need, we needed to modify it to be able to pull the data from IROTs first. So that was additional step. Um, so yeah, so we pull the data and then you can run the, the normal pipeline. And that, that's basically the config file simple original config file that we used. Um, so then Stain, Stain arrived in May and he started, he had no idea about Nextflow and he learned a lot during the last few months. So now I think he's quite good at it and he now actually creates some issues on Nextflow GitHub page. So, um, so what problems did we have? So th um, the first one was the amount of errors. So the, the, the sam basically, the amount of samples that we analyze is, is huge, usually. And there is always some errors that appear from time to time. And sometimes, basically, you can just ignore those errors. If it's just, because it's single, we usually analyze single cell data. You know, if you lose one cell out of several thousand cells, it doesn't really matter. So uh, what we do in, in case of errors, we put the error strategy to ignore. And usually, you know, we have less than 1% of errors, but we just ignore them. Because otherwise, you spend a lot of time figuring out what, what happened, which doesn't make any sense. In terms of biology, it doesn't add any value. Um, so, yeah, the storage is the IROT sometimes can be down and s things like that. So this is another source of errors. Um, uh, however, on a memory limit, we never put this error strategy. So on a memory limit, we always try to retry with bigger memory. So that's one characteristic of our pipelines. Uh, then also Stain developed uh, additional steps for failure reports. So our pipelines now basically re report uh, some more information of what's happening. And on failure, you will see which samples failed, you know, what happened, what went wrong, and so on. So this is, this is quite useful because uh, I think in the original pipeline, RNA-seq pipeline, we didn't have this information. So we had to figure out if, if some samples disappeared completely. Um, yeah, and so I think this was discussed yesterday. This issue basically stay and open it uh, to basically to add it as a feature to Nextflow to report additionally. Um, okay, so this this slide is about conditional code. So, yeah, again, original RNA seq pipeline had a lot of if statements. So, you know, multiple aligners, multiple different tools doing the same thing. You would put an if statement in your pipeline code. So instead, Stain basically use when and until uh, expressions directive, and this makes your code much cleaner. And also, it removes uh, branching on your diagram. If you plot a diagram of your pipeline, it will remove all this additional branching that you get. So it looks like this. Uh, I mean, here it's, it's, quite, it's already quite complicated for me. So uh, basically, that's how we use until. That's how we use when instead of if. So you can put it in the process. And then you basically use this parameter. Uh, here, it's, I think it's a nice way of mixing multiple channels together and then basically to, uh, forward them to some additional computation. And here we can turn off some, uh, some branch of the pipeline and run the rest in, well, yeah. So some of these channels will be uh, empty channels, so they won't run. And only the ones that are not empty will run further. But if you have any question about this slide, you can ask Stain afterwards. Uh, another feature, 
uh, Stain thought about was, we call it an onion feature. Uh, so the problem here was that we had uh, lots of whole genome sequencing samples which we had to align. And they were quite heavy and, and large. So, and also in iROD system, they are stored in multiple files. So you usually pull multiple files from iRODs, and then what we do, we would merge them together, and then you get one huge file which you align. And this, this took a lot of time. So Stain thought, can we actually align these small files uh, in parallel, and then merge them together afterwards as already aligned files. The problem here was that uh, Next flow would wait until all these onions basically finish, and then it would start doing the next step. So before Stain thought of the parallelization, the problem was there was lots of waiting until all the onions finish. And now uh, I think Paolo helped with this, and there was introduced this group key uh, function, which helps basically parallelize this, and you can you don't need to wait for all the onions to finish; they will go. Uh, independently in parallel. Um, okay, now this, this is it about all the uh, kind of internal pipeline stuff. So now I'm going to talk about more uh, the, the cloud environment that we have and how we run Nextflow on our cloud environment. So one of the, one of the reasons to choose Nextflow was also its portability because I already knew we were moving to the cloud, so I needed something which would work on LSF and the cloud. Uh, and uh, basically, Nextflow is very flexible on this, so you just need to change your config file, and you can run the same pipeline uh, with different config file, and it will work on different environments. So we, uh, when we uh, discovered that we have an OpenStack cloud, um, we needed basically to have some uh, in uh, Nextflow integration there. So at the moment, Nextflow doesn't have any integration with the OpenStack. However, at that time, Paolo has already started developing Kubernetes integration with Nextflow. So uh, that's why we decided that we want to deploy Kubernetes cluster on top of our OpenStack cloud, and then we will be able to run Nextflow. So this actually, uh, deploying Kubernetes on OpenStack if you don't use any kind of paid uh, software, it's not easy. So we used CubeSpray. Uh, it's like an open source initiative. It took us several months to make it work, but now it, it works, so now we can do it very quickly. But I would recommend to go for something which is kind of, which you can pay for and get it quicker and, and have some support as well. So, I mean, Kubernetes is a cool thing, but there are some problems deploying it sometimes. Um, yeah, and so basically also now, because we're on the cloud, we can, instead of our local software, we can use by container. So that's what we mostly use nowadays. So this is, I think this is, again, th there are discussions whether it's, it's good to have one big container with all the software in it, like what they do in an F-Core, or you have lots of multiple containers per step. So then you don't need to kind of have this huge thing. They were very light and more manageable. So we, we chose this one because in, in, in the case of bike containers, you don't really need to do anything because they're already maintained and supported. You just provide a link to the container and forget about it. So you don't need to maintain your own container in this case. And that's, that makes you, our life very easy. So why we chose Kubernetes? Um, so Kubernetes is basically, it's a container orchestration uh, platform. So you, you have it on your cloud, and then you can forget about all the infrastructure. So you don't think about instances anymore. The only thing you think about is basically Docker containers, and that's it. And, and it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's very cool. So you can, you know, you can start a Docker container there, and you don't even think where uh, Kubernetes will put it, on which node. You don't know about it, and you don't need to know. So you, you, just, you just work with the containers. So uh, Nextflow with Kubernetes, there is a documentation page. You can have a look. So what happens is usually Nextflow creates uh, its own pod. So in Kubernetes, instead of containers, there is a term pod. 
So you, you, you talk about, you always talk about pods. So Nextflow created its own pod. It's like a job. And then from that pod, it will basically start your pipeline and run all the things. And then you also need to mount some uh, specific volume to the cluster. So Nextflow should be aware of the volume. Kubernetes should be aware, aware of the volume. So there are some challenges here as well. But when you have all, all, all the things together, it works, which is nice. Um, yeah, so at the moment, we're actually, uh, together with Paul, we're trying to kind of write down this setup that we have and basically explain what are the difference between LSF and Kubernetes, what are the challenges, and also benchmark and see whether it's how much slowdown you get on the cloud compared to LSF, for example. Because uh, you inevitably you will get slowdown here because there is lots of networking happening on, on, on any cloud. So it will always be slower than the normal you know, cluster where you're very close to the hardware. Here, you're far away. There are several layers of networking. So obviously, there will be some slowdown. Uh, so Kubernetes, if you're not aware what it is, it's a Google product. And they started developing it in early 2000s. And uh, in 2014, they made it open source. And it was picked up by community very quickly. Um, uh, yeah, so that's why. And you know, my thinking was, at the moment, this, this is probably, there is no equivalent of this by any other company. So if you want to stay with the same thing for some time, it's better to take something which, which is you know, cutting edge at the moment. And then you know, at least we'll, 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 we can use it for several years instead of changing afterwards very quickly to another thing. Uh, OK, next law on Kubernetes. Uh, basically, there, is, there will be only a few slides. Uh, so the pipeline itself is the same, didn't change. However, the, how you run it, uh, it uh, the way you run it changes. So there are several ways of doing it. So you, the, the most general way would be next flow cube run instead of run. Um, but in this case, basically what happens, you run it from your local computer Nextflow interact with the Kubernetes cluster, creates, creates its own pod, and then run the pipeline. And you, here you don't have any kind of control about, you know, control of the system, I would say. So that, I mean, that's the default option, but we didn't find it very useful. Uh, another option is to use kubrun login command. And then what happens is that Nextflow create this initial port and then it logs into the port and then when you're inside the port you can actually run the pipeline the same way as you run it on LSF so you, then you just say next low run and all the stuff like this uh, but in this case next low would create its own port from Paolo's docker image so we didn't have a lot of control about that so uh, the way we do it is now uh, we, we, we run this command so kubectl is a uh, kubernetes command that's how you interact with Kubernetes cluster. So we create this pod manually, the, the next flow pod, and then we go to the pod and then we run the pipeline. So that's, that's how we usually operate on Kubernetes. And in this case, we have full control because in this initial pod, we can actually have all the software that we need, uh, you know, in, in addition to next flow. Um, okay, so on the cloud, we couldn't easily get data from iRODs uh, because on the farm basically all the iRODs installation was there all the necessary environmental variables were set up so it was you know we didn't even think how to pull data from iRODs on LSF when we moved to the cloud it wasn't easy because there is no basically there is no information about iRODs there so uh, what we did, we created a container, uh, iRODS container, Docker image, which contains the iRODS software necessary to, to pull data from iRODS. Additional challenge was that iRODS needs a, a password. So when you're on the farm, you don't use it. But if you're an external user, you need a password to be able to pull the data from there. So we solved this problem by uh, using Kubernetes secret uh, functionality. So you can actually add as many secrets as you want to Kubernetes 
And then inside of every Docker container, they can be used by the software. So Kubernetes will give the secret to the software. So in this case, you don't actually expose your secrets. You can keep your pipelines open. Uh, so it's, it's, it was a challenge, but um, it's solved and it's, it's, it works nicely. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, we use bio containers. So for each step of the pipeline, we just provide a link to the bio container. And then you forget about it because it just works out of the box. You don't need to maintain it. You don't need to support it. It's all there, which is very nice. Um, OK, so we did some preliminary benchmarking of the pipeline, LSF versus Kubernetes. So I will show the slides. I mean, the results are very bad, but uh, I think at, at the moment we know the, uh, where the problems come from. And uh, basically, I will explain uh, what, what's going on. So this is, I think this is just an RNA -seq, bulk RNA-seq pipeline we run on Kuber, uh, uh, LSF and Kubernetes. So if we look at the memory usage, it's more or less the same. Um, then if we look at benchmarking, oh, sorry, it's uh, execution time. Uh, we can see that basically on Kubernetes, Star was doing something for a very long time, which was not uh, ideal for us. Whereas on the farm, Star was actually quite quick. So that was the first kind of worry we had. And then when we looked at uh, disk usage, um, so on the farm, again, uh, the disk usage was quite nice. Uh, Star had some uh, big uh, peak here. Whereas in Kubernetes, interestingly, uh, Star was using 60 gigabytes. On the farm, the maximum was 30 gigabytes. So uh, we think there is some, basically, we need to look at the next law reporting uh, functions because then if you look at the right, uh, this guy or right, there is nothing here. So it looks like on Kubernetes next law uh, thinks that everything is red instead of right. Um, yeah, so this is, but this is fine. So, but the main problem was here. So if you look at the CPU usage, um, on Kubernetes something really bad happened. So, uh, you know, we, at the, in the beginning, we didn't know what, what it was about because it, it's like, you know, on, on the cloud you have virtual CPUs and um, different architectures, so we didn't know what to expect. But now we think it's pro most probably because of the I.O. So because, you know, the, the star running times was like 600 minutes, and that's probably because the storage system that we used was very slow, and that's why then Kubernetes and Nextflow thought that the, it was mostly because of the CPU. It didn't have enough of it. So, yeah, at the moment we're tr trying to explore uh, what happened and what's going on. Uh, but our main, yeah, our main th uh, idea, uh, idea is that it's basically the storage system. So the default storage that comes with Kubernetes is, is very slow. So at the moment, we are trying to mount the same storage system to Kubernetes as we have on LSF farm. And basically, then we'll be able to, uh, to do proper benchmarking of the system. Uh, how much time do I have? No time? OK. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is our uh, kind of throughput, number of samples. We also share the data with external collaborators. A couple of slides here. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to into detail. So basically, Kubernetes also allows you to have, in addition to Nextflow, to have all the web stuff. Uh, and that's actually, this is very cool. Because now uh, you know, we, can, we can do cutting edge web development in addition to Nextflow. And Anton in my group is, is doing most of it. Um, and Jupyter is actually pretty cool. So to install Jupyter on Kubernetes, you, you do it with one liner. And then you can basically create a multi-user system. People will log in. They will end up on different nodes. You don't even think about it. And you can provide them with lots of compute resources and very, very, very nice uh, setup that we have now. With Jupyter, yeah, and at the end, I'd like to thank uh, Stein and Anton from my group, Paolo and Phil, obviously, Sangar IT, and uh, basically, it's uh, the head of our program and uh, my boss. 
and also we are hiring so we uh, we are looking for software de uh, web developer and software developer if you're interested both of these projects are related to human cell atlas very very interesting and uh, please let me know if you're looking for positions thank you